That's one, two. Season two of Pop Americana. Oh, oh, oh! I'm here at the Sesame Street set, which I have all to myself because Ernie and I just, that was a weird bumble thing, let's not talk about it. But I'm here because 2019 marked 50 years of Sesame Street. And that got us, Team Pop Americana, thinking, could we actually ever have another show like Sesame Street? So we researched, we read, we talked to people, and we realized, no, probably not. The show really was the result of the right people coming together at the right time to create just the right thing at just the right moment in history. A moment in history which was pretty transformative. Action has been taken. The crisis is begun. The 60s launched with John F. Kennedy's presidency and with it a new idea of what the country could be. We stand today on the edge of a new frontier. The post-World War II economic boom had pushed the United States into an unprecedented level of economic prosperity, but not everyone benefited from that. Beyond that frontier, our unconquered province of ignorance and prejudice, unanswered questions of poverty and surplus. One of those unanswered questions was about how there was a widening achievement gap among American students. Children from impoverished urban areas were being left behind, and a lot of them were kids of color. This is where television and ultimately Sesame Street came to play a pretty big role. What has color got to do with being friends? Nothing. Just look at our black on Sesame Street. There, there, there are brown people, there are pink people, not to mention every other color, right? There, there, there are monsters, there are penguins, there are grouches. And an eight foot tall yellow bird who's right. friends with everyone. Right. Quick interlude, by the way. TV got big in the 60s. By the beginning of the decade, 90% of American households had televisions compared to just 9% 10 years earlier. With that kind of widespread access, American life and culture were completely redefined. It was in the midst of all this change that this woman, Joan Gans Cooney, a small-time public TV producer, became convinced that television could help level the educational playing field for disadvantaged kids. Cooney had this to say in a four-hour interview with the Television Academy Foundation in 1998. I said, what? There is educational television, and I knew that I was born to be in educational television. It was St. Paul on the highway. In 1966, she teamed up with Lloyd Morissette, vice president of the Carnegie Corporation, and put together a report arguing that TV could be used for preschool education. As Cooney and Morissette were putting their plans in motion, President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Public Broadcasting Act of 1967, which helped change the course of American television. The act created the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and its goal was pretty simple, to better promote and support television that wasn't for profit, which already did exist, but had a lot of trouble competing with for-profit counterparts. The CPB quickly established the Public Broadcasting Service, AKA... <laughs> But the excitement of what the possibility of publicly funded television could mean for American citizens was kind of short-lived. The first big challenge to publicly funded television came just three years later, in 1969, with Richard Nixon's election. The U.S. was deep in the Vietnam War, and the costs were rising, so Nixon proposed cutting CPB funding in half. That led to this famous moment in American television history, Fred Rogers of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood going in front of the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Communications to defend funding for public television. I'm constantly concerned about what our children are seeing. And for 15 years I have tried in this country and Canada to present what I feel is a meaningful expression of care. And thanks in part to him, the CPB got to keep its funding. I'm supposed to be a pretty tough guy, and this is the first time I've had goosebumps for the last two days. <laughs> Looks like you just earned the $20 million. <laughs> and that was important for Cooney and Morissette. On the back of their report, they had succeeded in raising the $8 million needed to produce the first season of a show centered on preschool education. The money came from private foundations and the federal government. And yeah, that was Sesame Street. Sesame 
Sesame Street was established by the nonprofit Children's Television Workshop, now known as the Sesame Workshop. The show went against what was conventional wisdom at the time for children's programming. They, they brought together uh, this dazzling array of educators and children's book authors and illustrators and psychiatrists, psychologists. But Sesame Street didn't just want to teach preschoolers basic reading and math comprehension. They wanted to teach kids about, well, life. Take, for example, when actor Will Lee, better known as the beloved Mr. Hooper, passed away in 1982. CTW decided against recasting him. Where is he? Big Bird, uh, don't you remember we told you uh, Mr. Hooper died? Instead, they took it as an opportunity to teach kids about the finality of death and engage with the difficult questions that come with it. Now, how successful was Sesame Street actually? Within 10 years of the show's launch, meaning by 1979, 90% of American kids from low-income homes regularly watched the show. And recent research has shown a correlation between kids who had access to and watched Sesame Street growing up and improved elementary school performance, especially for boys, kids in developing countries, and black American children. Sesame Street, when it debuted in 1969, was such a development. It forced American education to revise its ideas for what five-year-olds and six-year-olds should be taught. Key to the success of Sesame Street in reaching a diverse audience in the United States was the fact that it aired on PBS affiliate stations. It was the show that brought audience to uh, PBS. And the demand for Sesame Street when it launched was so high that people were scrambling to find this new channel uh, on the set. And in certain markets uh, that hadn't yet gotten a PBS station, it created a demand from PBS. The Children's Workshop also invested in community outreach to promote Sesame Street and the importance of educational programming in poor, predominantly black neighborhoods. All of this, everything I've talked about so far, wouldn't have been possible in those early years of Sesame Street without the financial backing of the U.S. government. Because to get the show off the ground, Cooney and Morissette had to hustle for funds, and government funding was crucial. We had become what's called a line item in the federal budget that would cause a huge public outcry to announce that funding was stopping. But even though Sesame Street flourished and became an international phenomenon, it still struggled to be financially sustainable. And in 1981, its financial troubles came to a head when the federal government pulled all funding for the children's television workshop. That meant Big Bird had big problems and needed to figure out how to get the money. And so the children's television workshop turned, in part, to licensing and merchandising, though at first they were careful and cognizant of their brand and ultimate purpose. Not everyone at uh, Children's Television Workshop loved the idea of licensing the characters. Some were uh, appalled by the idea. Joan Gans Cooney, as CEO, had to uh, listen to these protests and weigh and measure what the right road would be. They proceeded with care. We started with books, heavily emphasizing books for children because that was much less controversial. But Sesame Street soon began licensing its characters more widely. By 1984, they were estimated to have appeared on 1,700 products. It was around that time that a talking plush toy actually saved Children's Television Workshop from financial trouble. There was a, a toy invented called Talking Big Bird. Money just poured into the Children's Television Workshop. Now, the 90s were a pivotal decade for television in the United States. At the turn of the decade, subscription cable television exploded, and with it, children's programming. People were really paying attention to what uh, preschoolers were watching. Because we do so well in licensing products, that's why so many people now are in children's programming. It's become a huge business when they saw what Sesame Street could do. Merchandising and product licensing became a core part of preschool programming. And this big purple dinosaur, which some of us never admitted to watching, was one of the first to give Sesame Street a run for its money. Yeah! It became its own craze, dominating ratings for children's programming. It seemed like you just couldn't turn on the TV without hearing that song. I love you, you love me, we're a happy family.
the show themselves become ads when, when they're designed to sell all of this licensed merchandise. It's really an unfortunate model for the way that we fund much of children's media because the licensing deals are getting cut before you're even starting to write the scripts. And if you don't have those really cute characters that are going to uh, move merchandise, you're probably not going to get your show even made, even if it's a wonderful show that has great educational value or, or great pro-social messages for children. Despite critics lamenting how super one-dimensional Saccharin the Dino was, Barney was a massive retail success and it brought in a lot of money. Less than a year after it premiered, experts in the licensing industry estimated that retailers moved more than $500 million in Barney products. And then three years later, in 1996, Sesame Street took over with this. A red furry doll that giggles a lot. Tickle me Elmo is the hottest thing this Christmas. The toy was introduced in July, and by Christmas, over one million had been sold. And even then, the demand hadn't been met. Somebody in the crowd yelled, there's the Elmos, and they rushed us. If your business model requires selling a lot of Elmo merchandise, then obviously you're going to have a bigger role for Elmo in your show, whether that's what children need or not. And so it ends up actually affecting what, what takes place on screen too. But America's love affair with Tickle Me Elmo didn't last forever. Kids weren't buying the, the kind of plush toys and puppets and things that kids from an earlier age were buying in droves. And that brought back more financial woes for Sesame Street. Between 2008 and 2015, the show lost more than half of its licensing income. That, coupled with the rise of streaming and on-demand viewing, meant that Sesame Workshop had to look for alternative revenue sources. And so Sesame Street said hello to HBO, but didn't say goodbye to PBS. Elmo thinks that you two need to respect each other. <laughs> when Elmo has a problem with his friends like Abby or Cookie Monster, Elmo listens and learns from what they have to say. In 2015, after operating at an almost $11 million loss, Sesame Street moved to HBO. And in October 2019, a new five-year deal with Sesame Street was announced. It would have the show creating new content, including a late-night parody talk show with Elmo, and it would be exclusively on HBO's new streaming service, HBO Max. Currently, Sesame Street episodes do end up on PBS stations about nine months after first airing on HBO, and it's still not clear when HBO Max shows will end up there. There's an argument to be made that the deal Sesame Street has with HBO actually creates a two-tier audience the ones who can afford a subscription to HBO, and those who have to wait to be able to watch it for free without unlimited access. And that argument also underscores that if that's the case, then that means Sesame Street has compromised its initial mission of being accessible to everyone across race and class lines. But is that really the case? Listen, when, when you are three and you drink from a sick, sippy cup, you don't know if what you're watching was produced in 2010 or 2019. You just know you like it. Children have never been denied Sesame Street on PBS. It's been constantly there. So why can't there be another show like Sesame Street? If we believe that as a society we need educational media for young children, then we should fund it using ways that doesn't exploit children. And, uh, and brand licensing exploits children. Meaning Sesame Street was created in response to a societal need, not for profit, not to sell plush toys or backpacks. Lo siento, Dora. While distribution fees and royalties are Sesame Workshop's biggest source of revenue today, it still receives foundation and government grants for specific projects. Through it all, they've retained what makes Sesame Street so unique. What makes it, well, Sesame Street. And yet, 50 years after Mr. Rogers' testimony in defense of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, attacks on government funding for media continue. I'm going to stop the subsidy to PBS. I'm going to stop other things. I like PBS. I love Big Bird. So we got government funded PBS using its resources to push for government funding. That's the BS. We're just debating the letter of the day, and that's P. I think it's an unfortunate development, one that's going to be a disappointment to the 170 million Americans who rely on public broadcasting every month. So there may never be another Sesame Street, but do we need one when we've still got this one right here? This was a lot of fun to film, and we hope you guys enjoyed the video as well. Let us know in the comments what you think, who your favorite Muppet is, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you next week with another great episode of Pop Americana.